we're all in good shape now. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So you all can see. Great. All right. Okay, great. So, so like I said, we're going to have a little bit of a background of what we're talking about. What is beyond 2025? What are we doing here? Um, we'll talk about the coalition's recommendations. We'll talk about the draft recommendations coming out of the Bay program and our sign-on letter. And then we'll do a little bit on the advocacy plan um, that I'll turn over to Drew uh, to, to walk through for folks. Okay, so by way of background, why are we here and having this <laughs> meeting doing this letter? Um, Chesapeake Bay program is currently operating under the 2014 Chesapeake Watershed Agreement. Um, there are 10 goals and 31 outcomes in this agreement. If you were at the Beyond 2025 a conference kickoff that we had for our conference a few weeks ago. Uh, we dove into this <clears throat> agreement in a little bit more detail. Um, it has a lot of uh, different you know, goals and outcomes. A lot of folks tend to focus or think about the water quality ones related to the TMDL, which are in this agreement, but it's a wide variety of goals and outcomes that we are currently working towards under this Bay Agreement. Um, 18 of the outcomes uh, have been achieved or are on track, so that's great. Great thing to celebrate as we approach the 2025 deadline. Um, but there are 13 outcomes that are either off track or, or we just don't know. We are unable to measure uh, where we are on those goals and outcomes. Um, and so that's obviously problematic. So um, again, wanting to celebrate what we have accomplished together, but also wanting to re recognize that there are 13 outcomes that we are just unaware of where we are at or they are just off track. Um, there's a great website um, called Chesapeake Progress. Um, I think Drew or somebody could probably drop it into the chat. Um, but this is where you can see this information. Um, we looked at this during the kickoff as well. Um, it shows, this is just a, a, a few of them, but this shows a few of the goals, high level goals on vital habitats, sustainable fisheries, toxics, and water quality. Um, and then some of the outcomes underneath each of those. And so you can see exactly where each one is at. So you'll see, for instance, black duck it is uncertain. We're not sure where we are in the black duck outcome, <laughs> but then other ones you can see SAB off course. You can see some of the blue crab on course. Um, and then you'll see other ones that say completed as well. So just be progress is a great way to sort of look at the Bay um, agreement and track uh, progress on all of the and outcomes. So uh, thank you for dropping that in the chat, Drew. Um, <clears throat> so we were working towards all of this 2014 agreement towards 2025, all projects in place. Uh, deadline at the 2022 Executive Council meeting, um, the Executive Council, Ex Executive Council for the Bay Program, which is the governors of all of the Bay states, the mayor of DC, EPA representing all of the federal agencies, and um, the Chesapeake Bay Commission Chair, that's who is made up of the Executive Council, charged the Principal Staff Committee, which is mainly the Secretary, State and Federal Secretaries, um, uh, with coming up with two different processes. The first is one you all might be familiar with. It was a reaching 2025 process that was done last year. Um, there was a subsequent um, 20, uh, reaching 2025 Court, um, and that was on how we are going to accelerate our progress to 2025, trying to get as close as possible to reaching those goals we just talked about. Uh, the coalition uh, submitted a, a lengthy comment letter on that um, as well, and so something we've been a part of, you know, since the very beginning. Um, the second piece of that was this beyond 2025 process. So. Um, asking that at the annual, the 2024 annual meeting, so the one this year in December. Um, the PSC is to bring recommendations to the Executive Council um, to how we're going to advance uh, science restoration and the partnership beyond 2025. So there is much more <clears throat> detail in the full charge the Executive Council gave, but this is just a snippet so you guys can see sort of where this all came from. It came from a charge from the Executive Council that we need to do these two things. So 
Like I said, the Beyond 2025 Steering Committee, this was pulled together in response to that Executive Council directive, um, and they are tasked with um, bringing this up to the PSC and the PSC to bring to the Executive Council in December. So there are 29 seats on this um, Steering Committee. Uh, there are two non-voting seats that represent the public. The coalition has a seat, and so does the Chesapeake Bay Trust. So we are the two non-voting uh, members of the public that sit there. Um, this process started about a year ago, a little over a year ago, um, and <clears throat> we were supposed to have come to kind of come to conclusion on some of the recommendations at the end, at our last meeting last week. Um, but I think we're going to have some more discussion and that. Uh, the final recommendations that are going before um, the principal staff committee and eventually the executive council um, are going to be finalized this month in June. So um, people may remember us talking about these five small groups that were pulled together through the Beyond 2025 steering committee. I think a lot of folks joined some of the public engagement webinars around uh, these five issues. So there was a shallow waters group, a people group, clean water, climate, and healthy watersheds. Um, so basically these groups um, came together over the course, I wanna say like six months um, and worked on recommendations from these groups, things that these different topic areas wanted to see beyond 2025. Um, and again, I think a lot of folks, um, I was representing on the people group. I know we had some other NGO folks that were able to join the climate and the shallow waters and clean water groups. Um, and so I think some folks were able to participate in this process and give some feedback here. The other thing that's been happening over the last year um, is that the Bay program hired uh, someone called ERG. Uh, they were a consultant that came in and they did a uh, program evaluation. Uh, so they interviewed um, a whole bunch of folks from within the Bay program. Um, and they also did some outside stakeholder listening sessions. They One of those was with the coalition steering committee. Um, and they released their findings and 11 considerations uh, that we can go through uh, just briefly. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just to give you all a sense of sort of what ERG heard from folks that are working within the program and um, some folks that are working from beyond the program. And so this may resonate with some of you all. Um, so some of the findings, the program um, is viewed as very, being very complex um, and it's a concern to stakeholders. There's a perception that the voices of external stakeholders are not being listened to. Um, it operates in a set of silos um, that make the program inefficient. Um, <clears throat> there's a review process for all of these uh, goals and outcomes called the SRS process, um, but it's not really meeting its full potential. Um, the program's uh, logic model uh, needs to be revised. Um, and again, other ones in here that uh, that folks might want to dive into um, later, but just to give you guys an overall sense of sort of what those findings were. So instead of calling them recommendations, ERG calls these considerations for the steering committee, um, the Beyond 2025 steering committee to think about as we're moving beyond 2025. Again, highlighting, bolding some of the ones I think stand out um, uh, to, and kind of match a lot of what we're talking about in our letter. Uh, exploring ways to streamline and simplify the program structure, um, you know, eliminating silos, improving transparency for all stakeholders, um, making sure that the right expertise is on the different um, levels of the program. So within the management board, the principal staff committee, making sure we have the right expertise there that are able to make decisions on all the different goals and outcomes and not just water quality. Um, and uh, and yeah, so these are some of the recommendations and uh, or considerations that the Beyond 2025 Steering Committee is thinking about as they're starting to put together um, their recommendations for Beyond 2025. So that's the background on why we're here, the quick and dirty. I know that we talked about it a lot, um, but there still might be some questions from folks um, who are not as familiar. So I will pause here to see if there's any questions just about the process um, and the background of all of this work. There's a Q&A. Anything coming through yet? So we might be good. Okay. 
Kristen, you talked about it so much, we know everything <laughs> history of this. That's great. All right, so um, moving on to the draft recommendations from the Beyond 2025 Steering Committee. So again, these are draft, these are not finalized. Um, and if you were again at the kickoff at our conference, you saw this as well. Uh, Martha Shimkin, who's the director of the EPHS Big Bay Program Office, and Anna Achilles, who's the director of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, or the co-chairs for the steering committee, and they presented this to everyone um, at the kickoff. So the first recommendation, so the recommendation that they have for this December meeting that they want to bring forward, or that the steering committee wants to bring forward as a draft, is um, updating the existing watershed agreement um, to um, optimize its impact and the partnership. Um, and it wants to you know, refresh and refine the goals and outcomes, which is great. Um, they do have a piece about the partnership itself um, that they want to add, but that has not been fleshed out yet. Um, the piece about the partnership is really getting into some of what the ERG report was talking about as far as the structure, um, sort of making things less complicated. I think um, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, it's a bureaucracy, so things can get really built up and complicated and, you know, uh, slow down progress. And so I think thinking about sort of how we can, uh, can adjust some things within the program to make that a little less complicated. Um, and so we still don't know exactly what the recommendation is going to be from the Beyond 2025 Steering Committee yet on the partnership, but we know that there will be one. Um, so underneath these on these little bullets is sort of the timeline from the Beyond 2025 Steering Committee. So by the meeting in 2025, they're suggesting that the program will prepare updates and edits to the agreement, vision, principles, preamble, and goal statements. So really the high level pieces of the agreement, looking at the vision, looking at the, the different principles and preamble that are in the Bay Agreement itself. Um, at the 2025 meeting, they would like the chair and other members to restate their commitment to the restoration effort. Um, so this is not for 2024, again, this is for 2025, they're talking about. Um, and then starting, um, it's actually starting with the Executive Council meeting in 2025 and continuing into the future. So this is actually something that's changed. It was 2026, and now they're suggesting 2025, which is good. Um, starting with the Executive Council meeting in 2025 and continuing as needed into the future, the program will review all the outcomes, the goals and outcomes. Um, and then in 2026 is when they will actually commit to the renewed partnership in writing um so those are that's sort of the timeline that we have here and we'll go over the timeline a little bit again as well but just to give you all a sense of what the bay program um beyond 2025 steering committee is looking at as far as the recommendations go from them so now we'll get into what is in our letter um what we're asking for is that this December meeting, the Executive Council recommits to the 2014 agreement. Um, there's no current plan for any kind of recommitment at this December meeting, verbal or in writing. As you just saw, a verbal would come in 2025, a written would come in 2026. Um, we feel it is really important at this critical juncture as we're approaching and going to, into the 2025 deadline that we hear and see a recommitment from the partnership um, that we are in this together and we are still moving forward together. Um, and something that we really don't want to wait for for another couple of years. So that's the number one ask in our letter. The second ask is for an, another directive um, from the Executive Council to the Principal Staff Committee. Um, and that would be to lead an evaluation of the current 31 outcomes um, and to identify suggested changes in 2025. Um, so obviously that's a little faster than what the other group, uh, the Beyond 2025 group is suggesting, um, but that's sort of, um, we're in line together though on the fact that these goals and outcomes need to be revised. So um, the second one is looking at um, and reorganization of the structure and governance of the program. So this is our partnership piece that we have put together based on a lot of what is in the ERG report, but also the feedback that we've received from our coalition members. Um, and we'll dive into each one of these bullets a little bit more detail in a second. Um, but this is that sort of capturing what our partnership piece is asking for. And finally, assessing the current accountability framework of the program. 
Um, this is something that is not at all in the Beyond 2025 Steering Committee recommendations. Um, the accountability framework uh, references what EPA has identified as their ability to hold the line and ensure that the jurisdictions and the other partners are doing their part. So everything from the WIPs um, to the uh, two-year milestone check-ins that they have to do, and then everything that the that EPA has in its toolbox in order to ensure that um, we are uh, making, that all the jurisdictions are making progress and working towards their goals. Um, so we will get into these a little bit more detail now. So lead evaluation of the current 31 outcomes. Um, so out of the 31 outcomes, there are three that are related to the TMDL, way more that are not <laughs> related to, the, to water quality in the TMDL than there are. Um, ERG actually flagged some of these outcomes that needed to be revised for a variety of reasons. Um, the other reason that we feel like this needs to happen sooner rather than later is because the agreement is already 10 years old. Um, we are already facing a lot of new challenges that did not exist 10 years ago. Um, we are gonna re we're gonna hit our land conservation goal in the current base. Bay Agreement, which is amazing, but we are rapidly losing land um, across the watershed uh, to different land use choices. We have the data centers, um, warehouses, so we really need a new goal for land conservation sooner rather than later. Climate change is not something that was really fully um, taken up or incorporated into the last agreement. Um, obviously, we need to change that. Uh, and the toxics goal within the, the Bay Agreement, PFAS is, is called an emerging contaminant, and we're now in a world where EPA has drinking water standards for how much PFAS can be in our water. Um, so, you know, there just needs to be a refreshing whether the goals have been achieved or not, because we're just living in a whole different time than we were, you know, 10 years ago. Um, another part of the process here um, is wanting to sunset this Beyond 2025 Steering Committee. Um, it is honestly not the most um, diverse and inclusive group of people. Um, there are two non-voting members of the public, myself and the Chesapeake Bay Trust that are on here. Um, and we think that there needs to be a new process, um, either through the existing infrastructure of the program or something else that needs to be created. But the Beyond 2025 Steering Committee is not the right venue um, to ensure that these goals and outcomes are being updated in the way that they need to be. Um, we also feel this whole process should start with stakeholder input. We had a really great working session at the kickoff a couple weeks ago where everyone self-assigned where they wanted to go, sat down with the Bay Agreement and dove in and talked about some of the changes right off the bat that we could easily identify that needed to be made. Um, and so we feel like this process really needs to start with the folks that are on the ground doing the restoration work, doing the community outreach and seeing the barriers to success in real time um, in order for us to be able to, you know, set those benchmarks for ourselves in the future. And lastly, um, we feel like all of this needs to be done through the lens of climate change, um, the impact from population growth, and through a DIJ lens. So how are all of these goals and outcomes in corp um, thinking through the impact from, from climate, increased large rain events, um, how the, the you know, boom population that we have in the region, and then also um, how are we ensuring that all of them are um, ensuring for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and justice uh, as we move through our work. So the second one, again, is going back to that independent expert for reorganization of the structure and governance. So there's a lot of really great findings in the ERG report around um, the structure of the program, the barriers that exist because of the structure, um, I think, any, you know, we heard a lot from the coalition when we were working through this the past several months, but I don't understand the program. I don't know how to engage. Um, it's very confusing. And so all of that was really uh, justified in this in this report as well. Um, so we're asking um, for there to really be an emphasis on living resources and healthy communities as we're restructuring the program. Um, an unintended consequence of the TMDL really was that it took sort of all of the um, energy out of the room for all of the other components of the Bay Agreement. Um, and everyone really started to focus just on nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment reduction. And so we really want to make sure that we're, that's still a part of what we're doing, but that it's not the only thing that we're focused on and that we're, you know, approaching this restoration effort from a much broader lens. Because as all of you know, the public, people that we're working with in communities are not worried about nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. You know, they're worried about their basements flooding. They're worried about their kids being able to swim in a, in a clean stream, you know, in their backyard, things like that. So um, 
wanting to sort of reframe the way that we're approaching our work and making sure that the program is set up in that new type of structure. Um, also revised strategy for stakeholder and public engagement. Um, our letter is very clear that we are often on the hook to push and advocate for public engagement, public comment periods, strategy, all of those things. Um, also for a seat at the table to make sure that we're you know, being represented and we feel like that needs to some, is something that needs to be codified. Um, that, so there's no guessing game when it comes to how the Bay program does public engagement. If they create some sort of steering committee, they create some sort of work group um, that is working on an issue for the partnership, um, there are automatic things that go into place, there are automatic time periods for public comment, and there are rules to follow for responding to those comments. So there is no guessing game and there's no there's less advocacy that we have to do to really push that. Again, the strategy review system, um, that is how they measure progress on all of the goals and outcomes within the agreement. Um, this is something that's in the ERG report as well, something that needs to be revised um, and something that uh, needs to that needs to be elevated more um, as we refocus our effort, not just on the water quality goals, but on all of the goals and outcomes. Um, and lastly, this is a little bit more in the weeds for folks that were around um, in uh, the early Obama years. Uh, uh, President Obama had issued an executive order on the Bay program, um, or on the Bay. Uh, this uh, federal leadership committee is something that um, was created in that executive order, and it brought together all the heads of the federal agencies to ensure that there was coordination and strategy among all of the agencies. EPA was to chair this and to pull these folks together on a regular basis. They haven't met since 2016, we believe, 2015. Um, and so we would like this to be reinstated. We've heard recently that this is something that they're looking at bringing back before the fall, which is great. Um, we're going to keep it in our letter to make sure that that does come to fruition. And then lastly, the last ask in our letter is about that accountability framework. Um, looking at the accountability framework, are there things that can be added into this that are not currently in there? Um, but honestly, what EPA has laid out, what they laid out in 2009, 2010, um, as their authorities under the you know, TMDL and Clean Water Act to ensure progress are really great. Um, we just want them to use it. <laughs> we want them to be looking at all those tools in their toolbox and seeing how they can you know, provide that oversight and accountability role um, that they are charged with. Um, there are certain things that haven't happened uh, since the last administration that we would like to come back, um, including the senior advisor to the Chesapeake Bay and Anacostia River, uh, also known as the Bay Czar position, um, a, a role that helped connect the EPA HQ with Bay Program in Region 3. Um, also, there, there are certain mandatory reporting things that have um, to Congress that haven't happened, um, as well as the hiring of an independent evaluator. Um, we also want EPA to clearly define what the role is of EPA Region 3 and EPA Bay Program. Um, EPA Region 3, you know, providing that oversight and accountability role again that we that we've been talking about, but then wanting the EPA Bay Program Office to be that convener and bringing people together and, and sort of rounding the states together and the other signatories um, towards this common goal. So ensuring that there are two sort of separate <laughs> uh, roles between the, EP, the two EPA offices, uh, which we know can be challenging, but making sure that they both are operating um, under what their what their charges are. Um, and then looking for accountability for the whole agreement, right? So the TMDL, obviously, there has the Clean Water Act behind it, um, but wanting some the states to sort of come up with some kind of mutual accountability for not achieving their goals on forest buffers. Um, you know, how are we how are we holding each other uh, to the standards that we're setting for ourselves? So what is the same about what I just laid out from the coalition and what the Beyond 2025 steering committee has laid out? We agree there needs to be a recommitment to the Bay Agreement. Um, we agree that there needs to be some revised, some um, it needs to be revised and amended um, and be updated, um, and that the partnership, that governance and structure, needs to change for us to be more efficient. Um, but he, what's, what's different is the timeline, um, and we're going to go over that in a second in this crazy long timeline that I'm about to show you that I hope isn't too confusing. Um, and then also the May program doesn't have anything on the accountability framework, um, which we think is important. So here is the timeline for from now until 2026. So the public engagement period is starting on July 1st um, through the end of August. So I believe it's August 30th. 
that is the time that folks are able to submit uh, their their public uh, feedback. Um, they're not responding to these comments, so they're calling it a public feedback period, public engagement period, not public comment. Um, so we will not be receiving feedback or comments to what we submit. Um, between September, that August 30th, um, in basically September, um, is the time that they have to digest all of the feedback that they receive, um, potentially incorporate anything, um, and get it into whatever they're presenting to the management board, which is the first line of approvals that the recommendations will need to go through. So it'll go management board, principal staff committee, executive council. That management board meeting is the beginning of October, which means that the materials for that meeting need to be ready two weeks in advance, um, which makes the ability to influence whatever comes out of that public, uh, you know, the draft basically, and anything that's going through the public engagement period really short. So it's like two to three weeks that they really have to look throughout all the feedback that has been received, try to incorporate anything into those final recommendations. Um, the EC approves the recommendations. Their meeting is in December. Um, and then there will be another EC meeting uh, in October of 2025 tentatively and October of 2026 tentatively. They normally meet in October. It's December this year because of the election. Um, but so the 2025, 2026 month could obviously change as well in the future. Here's our timeline. So our steering committee approved the recommendations at our conference uh, a few weeks ago. We have our sign-in letter out right now and are starting our advocacy now. We're gonna continue that advocacy in full force uh, until like middle of June, and, or, or sorry, middle of July and July. Um, we will continue to advocate beyond that, but the as you can see, the crunch time really is that beginning part of the public engagement period um, because the timeline is pushed up so closely against when the decisions are going to happen. The earlier we start our advocacy, the earlier we have our letter out and our requests, the more likely we are to have any kind of influence um, in what the final product is. Um, so again, we want a signed recommitment um, and the directive in December, start working on you know, the directive, the structure of the accountability framework, are those things. The next meeting talking about the revisions to the goals and outcomes, approving revisions to the structure in 2026. So that's sort of what we had just talked about and laid out. Um, here is what we're looking at for the um, beyond 2025 timeline. So they're still in the process of developing the recommendations. So we will not see those final recommendations from the Beyond 2025 Steering Committee until right before public engagement period. Um, this, like I said, we're supposed to be seeing something on the partnership this week, I think, um, the Beyond 2025 Steering Committee is, um, but they do not have that fleshed out yet. Um, so once those are finally approved, they'll go out for public engagement, like I said, July 1st to October 20th or October or sorry, August 30th. Um, you see that line in there for when the materials are due to the management board meeting, and then the management board and PSC meetings are in October for those approvals. And then all of that time after that will be in prep for that December executive council meeting. Um, their timeline is to sign the directive, start working on the revisions to the vision principles and preamble, um, the verbal recommitment, and starting to look at the um, goals and outcomes. Uh, and then continuing to work on the goals and outcomes into 2026 and beyond. So again, very similar things that we're looking at, but we have a much more accelerated timeline. We have our, our partnership asks laid out um, and we know what we need. Um, and then we have something on the account accountability framework, which is something that the big program has, does not have. Um, so before I pause for questions, um, I've gotten this question a lot, you know, not a lot, but a few folks have asked, you know, why are we doing this now um, versus waiting to see what comes out of the Beyond 25 Steering Committee? Again, and I think anyone that's been part of a, a public um, comment, public engagement, public feedback period knows that the most likely you are to have any sort of impact or make any sort of change in what goes out is before that public comment period actually starts. Um, you know, as NGOs, we do sign on letters all the time. And I think, uh, you know, changing something after the fact is much harder than trying to influence what is developed originally. So because there is no partnership goal currently or partnership directive, wanting to try and influence that as much as we can right now, 
um, with our ideas and thoughts. Um, and then given the timeline of when that public engagement period is, we want to make sure that we are getting our, uh, you know, what we want, what we want to see as the NGO community and our recommendations out there sooner rather than later, because there's not a lot of time again for them to really digest everything after that August 30th deadline and get it incorporated into, you know, what is going forward. Um, I've been told to tell people to, that they recommend getting, if you are interested in doing your own final letter, which I, you know, definitely support, um, or just your own letter in general, getting it in earlier rather than later during that comment period, um, because they're going to review it as it comes in. And so we're going to be submitting, we'll have, you know, be making a lot of noise anyway during this month and into July, but um, we're going to be getting our letter in earlier in July than waiting until the end of August for just for that reason as well. So, so that's why we sort of started this when we have, um, we also have the benefit of being part of the Beyond 2025 steering committee. So we're able to see sort of what recommendations are coming out of there, what people are thinking. Um, and so we're able to sort of help develop, you know, what we what we were thinking as well at the same time. Um, and all those meetings are also public. So anyone is able to join and listen in if you guys are interested in learning more um, about that process. So, so that was a lot of information, um, but I will pause here to see if folks have any questions at all um, about Beyond 25 Steering Committee, our question or our recommendations, the timeline, anything that folks uh, have questions about. I think I can just allow people to talk, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right, Ben, I, I think I've allowed you to talk. Let's see, does that work? Yeah, is this working? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, so thanks so much for this. This is really informative. Um, recently for the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership, got the steering committee interested in potentially doing a, a letter as well, but they, you know, there's a lot of want of like seeing what the actual thing is that we can actually respond to. Is there any way to see some draft of that early so that we can actually have like real, um, real comments, like addressing the actual document in our sign on letter, in our feedback? Yeah, I can share with you what's been made public on the Beyond 2020 or on, like on the website. Um, they do not, I do not know if they're going to have the actual letter until much closer to the July 1st start date. Um, we, at our May 30th meeting last week, we saw an outline of what that looks like, um, not even a full version of a draft yet. So they're working on it now. Um, and I would, um, oh, June 28th is what Anna has said, yeah. Because I think, Rachel, I'm pretty sure the June 28th is the next Beyond 2025 Steering Committee meeting. And then, I'm pretty sure that's right. And so then that's when we would see it, okay, June 27th. So there's, they're thinking the day after the next meeting, um, it would be public. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, essentially July 1st, <laughs> almost. Um, that last Friday, last Thursday, yeah, last Friday before July 1st is when we're they're thinking they'll be able to put it out there. So I can send around the draft or like the outline because that is public on there. So I'm happy to share that with uh, with folks um, if that's helpful, Ben. I'm also happy to have a conversation too um, with anybody who's interested to give them any other feedback or any other tidbits of what I know. Okay, thanks. Any other questions, thoughts? Now that I know how to unmute people, you can raise your hand. It makes it super easy. Um, and I see, yeah, I know Rachel. Rachel, if there's anything else that you wanted to add on here, um, let me know if there's anything I missed. Um, you can raise your hand and I can allow you to talk to. <laughs> Nothing else. That's great. All right. Um, so what are we asking for? <laughs> um, we are asking for folks to um, 
sign on to our coalition sign on letter. I think Drew can probably drop the link to the sign on letter in the chat. Um, because I don't know if people can click on that in here. Um, can you? Oh, you can. Oh, that's cool. Um, <laughs> look, at that. <laughs> look at that. I don't know if other people can. Can other people do that though? I don't know. Maybe just me. Um, but, um, yeah, so we're asking people to sign on to our sign on letter. The deadline right now is Friday, July 12th. Um, like I said, we have a big leeway because this really isn't due until um, uh, um, the end of August. But again, we want to get this in sooner rather than later. Um, and so just wanting to give ourselves enough leeway, um, but also not make it you know too long. Um, so if anyone has questions about what is in the sign on letter, you know, why this is important and all of those things, um, you know, please let me know. We tried to um, answer some of that in here and in this webinar, um, but I would say the biggest thing is, you know, what ends up becoming a priority and what is a priority within the Bay program and, and you know, a revised agreement, this edited agreement, um, has a really big impact on how resources are allocated. Um, you know, we advocate every year for the federal funding for the small watershed grants, the INSR grants, um, now Chesapeake Wild, and all of those are in service to the Bay Agreement, um, especially the Chesapeake Wild being, you know, specifically not focused on water quality, but on other things like habitat and wildlife. And so if we and you are working on something in your, you know, part of the watershed, um, that you want continued focus on and continued funding for, this is something that you're going to want to be a part of and something that you're going to want the Bay program to be making a priority within that agreement. Um, it's not in that agreement. It's harder for us to advocate for them to be putting resources to it, right? But if they've committed to it, the jurisdictions have committed to it, that makes it much easier for us to say, hey, you need to be putting money towards this because this is something that everyone has agreed is important and that needs to be done in the watershed. So, again, one of the um, reasons why I would highly recommend that uh, you're signing on, but if you have any questions about that um, or have other you know, folks on your board or anyone else that's you know, curious as to why they should really care about what's happening here, I'm happy to have those conversations with folks. So, so with that, I will turn it over to Drew, who will talk a little bit about our advocacy strategy for this. And I'm happy to answer, oh, Ben might have another question before we move. But, and apologies for my ignorance here, but for the link, it goes to kind of a um, general outline of what that sign-on letter is, but is there a link to the sign-on letter, like the, the exact language or the exact document itself? So, yeah, but then I'll forward it to you. I don't think we, I don't think we can put, can we put links in there? We, we can put it in the sign-on form. We'll just have to like create a PDF Google Doc, which is fine. Oh, we I can see. do that. Okay. I think we should. Yeah, I will. Um, and I can also, um, I think I already have one actually, but yeah, I can forward it to you as well, Ben. Okay, thanks. Cool. Well, let's um, dive on into uh, all things advocacy plan. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be going over, um, Chris has already done a fantastic job covering, so I'll go into an incredible amount of detail, but um, just wanted to touch upon some of the high level pieces. First of all, happy Chesapeake Bay Awareness Week. Um, uh, Chesapeake Bay program started, I think, around 2017 or so. Um, the Chesapeake Bay Awareness Week, that first week in June, um, so I think technically it started June uh, on, on uh, Friday and then uh, or Saturday rather and then is going through um, this Saturday. But we want to, you know, um, lift up Chesapeake Bay Awareness Week by talking about this really uh, you know, critical juncture that, that we're in um, and how uh, if their decisions being made now um, are having going to have a dramatic impact on the, the state of the Bay for, for years to come. So, um, a couple of quick things I wanted to just run through is um, one, our communications toolkit. Um, we'll circulate all these links. I'll drop them in the chat in a second here. But as far as a quick recap goes, definitely not going to go through that because Kristen just walked through it all. But this could be a really helpful resource to share with colleagues and partners if they're curious where things stand. Um, we have some top line messaging here that we also uh, recommend. And these are our asks, of course. The sign on letter, everything Kristen just walked through goes into a much greater level of detail. But uh, from a 20,000 foot level, we're asking the executive council to recommit to the uh, 2014 Chesapeake agreement and then refresh it to update it. Um, so 
Uh, I'm a big fan of alliteration, so we can just stick with recommit and refresh as a way to help folks remember um, what we're really asking for. As far as targets are concerned, I'll, I'll scroll down here just a, a little bit. Um, we're really trying to influence the states, um, the state leaders and the, and the state agencies that are um, impactful in uh, making some of these decisions. Um, and, and the EPA as well, but really um, there are states that we're wanting to influence um, because they're the ones that are, are, we need to get on board to, to drive the ship. So in regards to targets, we have a list of, um, from the social media perspective, of uh, targets that you can uh, contact uh, to um, raise your voice for the Bay Restoration effort. But scrolling back up a little bit, as Kristen already just walked through um, our advocacy timeline, you know, uh, there's certainly a, a good, lots of good reasons for our, why we're wanting to do this now and get out in front of the, uh, get out in front of it before the um, public comment period officially opens, or excuse me, the public feedback period, because um, there's a difference. Um, so that's a little bit more about our timeline there. Um, and as far as what you can do, we've tried to come up with some ideas for, that can reach every organization. Um, well, I know a lot of nonprofits are represented on this call. Um, but uh, trying to provide, you know, the really low level asks, the low lifts to something that's a little bit uh, more of a bigger ask um, so that there's no matter where your organization falls on the uh, spectrum of capacity and time to tackle some of these things, um, there's some some things that you can do. So certainly posting on social media is a very low level, easy thing to do. And we've made it really easy by, by providing some social media posts. Of course, you can feel free to customize this as you see fit. Um, but uh, this is a one great way to um, raise your voice for uh, this effort. And we're asking uh, folks to do this uh, throughout this whole week and you know the whole month really, but especially this Thursday, our day of action, um, so that there's a lot of attention uh, called to um, what our asks are. Um, sending an action alert, um, as Kristen mentioned, we encourage organizations to send their own letters um, and you can even get your organization's members to sign on to an action alert so that they can have X number of people saying that they support this. That certainly can make a, a, a difference because a lot of the decision makers that were, were, influenced, were attempting influence, you know, uh, have to answer to voters. Um, and so we want to uh, have them uh, know that uh, our um, their constituents are, are, are paying attention and, and, and to this and, and wanting them to take action. Uh, so setting an action alert, um, publishing an op-ed or a letter to the editor. Uh, we have several op-eds with uh, coalition member organizations in the works um, throughout the whole watershed. Uh, we're excited about those, but if you or your organization is interested in writing an op-ed, please don't hesitate to reach out. We'd love to help coordinate with that, help with writing, have placement, all that good stuff, because again, um, our uh, decision makers really, they read those opinion pages. Even as newspapers influence wanes uh, on the large scale, the opinion pages still uh, still matter and carry, carry influence. Um, again, going back to uh, speaking to nonprofits here for a moment, um, email really is still king uh, in terms of how to engage your, your members. Um, and so, Sending an email uh, to your members, even if it's just an engagement one, not an action alert, letting them know what's going on and what your organization is doing is a great way to um, keep folks in the loop. Um, one of the things that you could do in that is maybe publish to a blog. That's one other way to just, again, uh, uh, share your voice, lift up your voice on this issue, um, as well as maybe linking to a blog and social media posts. That's always uh, recommended. Um, of course, uh, to reiterate, uh, signing the coalition's letter is certainly a, a low-level ask, um, but something that's really, really important. Um, uh, a line that I've been saying, and I know others have too, is that every year we usually, around uh, January and February, when our appropriations asks are, our appropriations letters are um, being circulated throughout the coalition membership, we always say these are the most important sign-on letters of the year. And uh, usually that's true, but this year it's actually this one. <laughs> So um, if you're uh, if you only signed one letter this year, um, I even got permission from Peter to say this. If you only <laughs> signed one letter this year, sign this one. Um, this is a really important one. Um, and then uh, as again, as we already mentioned, uh, signing your writing your own uh, letter is also encouraged. Um, 
One last thing I just wanted to highlight, uh, but certainly something that can influence um, decision makers is the almighty dollar. Um, and uh, going back to those appropriations asks, um, uh, decision makers want to know and love to know uh, how much money is going into their their district or their constituents. Um, and, you know, uh, the, this restoration effort is obviously very closely tied to those projects. Um, and so we have some numbers here, thanks to our friends at NIFWIF, just highlighting how much money has been dedicated towards these conservation projects throughout the watershed um, since the year 2000. Um, so these are some big numbers cumulatively. Um, and so using, and there are some suggested talking points down here for uh, how to use these numbers. Um, but this is obviously great uh, content for us to share, to encourage, to sh showcase to our decision makers to that these, um, this effort that we're supporting or we're asking them to support and to recommit and to refresh um, comes, you know, along with that comes um, dollars that can really make a difference um, to their local waterways. So um, that's what we have for the toolkit. One other um, piece I want to um, share quickly is um, our, uh, just one second. There we go. One other piece I'm um, just wanting to share uh, is our comms talking points to messaging doc. I'm not going to go through this um, closely, but uh, again, we'll drop this in the chat. This is something that the coalition's communications work group um, has pulled together um, starting really last fall. Um, and it's been a, a great collective effort. Um, this goes into a lot more detail um, than the, the toolkit that I just walked through. Um, and so I'll, I'll send this along with lots of top line messaging regards to where we stand in the restoration effort, what we're looking for moving forward. Um, a lot of the talking points that we need to address. Um, so we have a point counterpoint session, uh, section that uh, folks have found helpful. And then another piece, um, we don't wanna forget about Caesar. And so lifting that up and having some talking points for that. So I'll, I'll drop that in the chat as well, but we certainly encourage you to use these resources um, and to uh, you know, adapt them, customize them for your organization. Um, and uh, we're, of course, always around and available to help um, and uh, provide any assistance we can. Ben, did you have another question or is that your hand just still raised from before? Sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I didn't find another question. Um... Great, thank you, Drew. Uh, all right, any questions, comments, thoughts, anything that is left unsaid at this point? <laughs> we'll be talking about this a lot on all of our other calls coming up, um, our work group calls and things like that. Um, we have our TMDL call tomorrow um, with folks that live and breathe a lot of this. So that'll be an interesting conversation. So if anybody, um, wants to learn more, let me know. We're happy to add you to the TMTO work group um, email uh, and uh, you signed up there. Um, yeah, anything, I don't have any other thoughts or questions, anything to cover? Hopefully this has been helpful um, and helped answer some questions from folks. We will send out um the recording to this along with the link to the sign on and all the comms reach our uh, resources that drew sent along um and we also actually um i don't think i can drop stuff in the chat drew but if you want to yes. drop the blog that Just has like all of this stuff um so we do have a blog on our website it's the first um rotator when you get to our uh, home page um but if you go to the blog it's the first blog on there right now or, sorry second blog on there um read about the cape and lost rivers land trust first and then read about um our vision for beyond 2025 so we will update this blog um with information uh that could be useful to you all um we have a link to the back to the future webinar series that we did they talked about the history of the bay program all the previous agreements um, starring Peter Marks and one of them, 
Um, it also has a link to the Chesapeake Bay Progress website that I talked about that shows where we are on the agreement um, and the outcomes. Um, it has a link to all, all the recommendations letter that you were looking for, Ben, um, and the sign-on link uh, to the form. It also has links to the toolkits and everything like that. Um, and we can upload the recording uh, from today to this page as well. So um, that'll be a good link to have because I think that's one place that we're going to put everything uh, and keep updating. And when the public uh, comment period does open, we will let everybody know. Um, and I, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with hearing from more people and having more people submit comments and feedback to the Bay program. Obviously, we'd love for you to sign our letter as well, but I think especially if there's something that your organization is specifically interested in seeing in the new version of the agreement, um, something that you think is important, I would definitely use this as an opportunity, um, like CCP with, with Ben, definitely looking at planning conservation and encouraging, you know, a quicker timeline for that, um, given the importance of land conservation, I think it's a great focus. Um, but, you know, I think the more that folks hear from from this from the NGO community, from coalition members and non-coalition members, uh, I think the better. So again, like you said, we're happy to help however we can to just get those comments in um, on the earlier end of that public engagement period than the later end. Uh, and that, that would be my, my advice. So, all right. Well, if there's no other questions or comments, we did an excellent job going right under 11 o'clock. So look at that. Um, great. Well, we'll see you guys around on the other worker calls. Again, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And thank you all for joining today.